So to start off with the meeting question of the day. Oops, sorry. What's the scariest game or moment in a video game that you've played? Person in the chat said Outlast when the main character was about to be sawed in half. I think the most tense uh, oh, I've, I've at least witnessed is in um, Poppy Playtime Chapter 1 with the, uh, like the vent chase when you're being chased by the Um really separates the game from being just like a, an indie clone of, of stuff uh because like that and it gets you going immediately because you actually have control over that to an extent i'll say for me that um i i say for um me it's like overall like silent hill 4 just the entire vibes of it because if you don't know uh, silent hill 4 um you the overall part it takes place in your room which you may think okay not that big of a deal but your room but you can't escape your room for some unknown reason and your room over time starts becoming more haunted and it starts feeling more claustrophobic and i just like the whole vibes of like your room that you think is like the safest area to be in is actually dangerous you know hmm? um Another new horror game that's been making the rounds lately is uh, Mortuary Assistant. Have you ever heard of them? Um, if you guys don't know what that is, it's uh, basically you you play as a mortuary, someone who basically has, who basically takes care of dead bodies. But the trick is one of them is possessed by a demon, so you have to figure out which one is possessed and burn it. Mm -hmm. Uh, this isn't really from a horror game, but um, the Gory series, mm -hmm. uh, for the first chase sequence. Um, like, sure. the whole thing is that, like, um, you're trying to, like, get the cor like, corruption essence stuff out of, like, a tree to, like, purify the water in the forest. But the thing is, once you destroy the corrupted essence, you get this little notification. Uh, in the top of the screen, it says achievement unlocked. Run for your life, and then like that's the only warning you get before like water starts rising around you, and you have to like basically run your way out of the tree. And like it just kind of like builds in intensity, like you're trying over and over just to get out. And then once you finally do get out, you get a moment of peace. Before um, the antagonist of the game, this giant like owl thing ends up chasing the main character off the cliff in a cutscene. So the main character, just, he's just kind of falling, and then from the distance you see the owl just kind of slowly approaching, and then, yeah, pretty much like the whole thing. That sequence was incredible. I'll say a big part of it's probably just the music, though. Oh, um, yeah, the definitely. composer did an incredible job for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, the scary mo moment doesn't have to be from a horror game. It can just be from any game. But yeah. Yeah, this is just a good game. Yeah, just a game that like freaked you out. <laughs> yeah, because even the uh, scary moments in like a really bright game can uh, you act as a foil to the happy moments. Mm -hmm. You have little nightmares, nightmares too. I've heard very good things about those. those oh yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, I can see those ones like the entire time, the atmosphere itself, um, adding to like the like interactive part of it and just trying to keep quiet the entire time it's not exactly a stealth game but plenty of it you have to be careful what you're doing so yeah uh someone brought up in the chat phasmophobia but specifically when you're playing with it alone oh. uh, when you're playing with friends it actually gets more funny than scary and i believe that's the point brought up on the slides later so uh, you can't help but agree mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, the Metroid Prime series has a lot of very unnerving moments, but to pick one myself would probably be the uh, GFS file Alice ship from Prime 3. It's essentially just this stranded ship that has a really unnerving red atmosphere, everything's just broken. And the whole, you know, sort of, throughout the series you've been dealing with this incredibly dangerous eugenic essence and you just sort of see its, you know, fingerprints, I suppose, everywhere around. So there's just this constant feeling of everything's horrible. You can like, you can find, you know, corpses of people who used to be there, and they literally scatter into dust when you get close. It's a very unsettling area, in general. And of course, the music doesn't help any. You live in isolation. Pretty much. I, yeah. <laughs> The other uh, Discord suggestions, uh, a game called The Forest, one in VR, there's uh, Darkwood, Iron Lung, The Evil Within. Oh, yeah. It's like playing the games. All right, let's move on. All right. So what exactly is horror? Well, generally, horror is the idea of preying on the audience's fear to elicit any sort of shock, emotion, just intense emotions in general. Uh, usually playing upon something that the player obviously doesn't want to happen. Um, is of course what fear is. Um, pretty common, uh, like fears you'll, come, you'll see uh, horror play, uh, play upon is like when somebody has very little control of the situation they're in, um, being chased by like some creature or being stuck in like a place that they can't escape from, that sort of stuff. Um, the inability to trust oneself or others. Uh, I think The Thing is a really good example of that. A great horror movie. Um, I guess sort of the groundwork for Among Us. Um, <laughs> or Fear of the Unknown, which is something you might hear about quite often, especially in like more literary or academic circles um, in relation to human fears. But uh, yeah, not knowing about something, or like you're in the dark, you don't know what's there. Usually that's what the fear of the dark comes from, is not knowing what's around you, that sort of thing. Or a fear of like, what you're gonna do in life, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, horror can, can play upon uh, tiny uh, concepts like that, all the way to grander cosmic levels of uh, what can scare you. Yeah, and everyone is different, so there are some things that may scare you, and, and some things that may not scare others from maybe um, personal traumas or from growing up in different environments and cultures. Like there's different like cultures of monsters that only really make sense if you lived in that culture. So that's well. So creating fear. The main thing with creating fear is that it requires a lot of subversion and suspense. If you played out for too long, or if you played out for too short, or if you time it wrong, it can destroy the whole entire suspense of horror, and if and you know it can make it a lot weaker, and it may actually backfire and make it funnier than actually scary. So it's worth noting you can draw out the suspense quite a lot longer than you might first think if you keep things vary enough. If you keep the players interested in other ways, uh, mm -hmm. this is already brought up in the Discord, uh, but Iron Lung is essentially a full hour of just ever building suspense, and it works just because what's in the game is enough to keep you interested. There's just enough new strange things happening that it doesn't really burn the player out. So if you have variety, you can go for uh, quite a while. Mm -hmm. Certainly the, uh, the length of like how long you build suspense very dependent upon the themes you have, the environment, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, this particular GIF that I've um, chosen is from the movie Strangers on a Train uh, by uh, classic thriller master Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, it's a pretty great film uh, where two strangers meet on a train and they each have someone they don't want in their lives anymore. Uh, one of them is crazy enough to kill the other person's unwanted person. Uh, and 
He's yeah. been ch he chases the other person around, uh, stalks him pretty much, so that he can end up killing the person he doesn't want in his life. Um, and this is a particular scene where the innocent guy is at his tennis match, and he looks over to the crowd. Everyone's watching the tennis match. But uh, as it slowly zooms in, you see the other fellow who is very intent on getting him to commit murder as well. Um, so it keeps that level of suspense throughout the entire film. Um, obviously there are highs and lows. Um, uh, and you, you can certainly, um, you know, subver, uh, subver expectations by uh, putting up points of suspense that don't actually eat anything and just keep the, play, uh, the player or viewer or audience on their toes. Uh, but of course, doing that too much will, you know, uh, allow the genuine feeling of it to wear off pretty quickly. So in terms of video games, there are five main types of horror game genres that are used. There's survival horror, psychological horror, action horror, stealth horror, and jump scare horror. Yeah, so I just brought up puppet combo games. So yeah. I know you have something to say about those. Yeah. <laughs> so the first one, survival horror. Of course, the main focus of survival horror is to survive. This can honestly apply to all the types of horror games, but generally with survival horror games, of course, um, a lot of the games, they lack sort of resources. They have a lot of exploration with them. The enemies are constantly trying to attack you. So it's just generally, the game just wants to kill you and you need to stay alive. That's the main focus of survival horror games. And because of that, these games are generally not the easiest. Um, and they can get kind of tedious sometimes with trying to stay alive because, you know, maybe that one enemy keeps trying to kill you and you're just like, how am I supposed to avoid him? An example of this are like Resident Evil 7 and The Evil Within. Yeah, this is, uh, I'd say this genre focuses more on the taking control over the player. Um, lots of horror games these days give the player little actually usually zero control over what they can do. Um, so Horror switches that up a little bit by putting the player's life in their own hands um, in most situations. Uh, you know, you have a ammo, um, certain keys and puzzles you can do yourself uh, while the entire world is you know, actively working around you. Um, and it's up to you to you know, preserve your resources. Um, if you use just the wrong number of bullets, the wrong type of weapon, then you're screwed later on and you won't be able to pick up anything else. And uh, sort of going on this a bit, this is also applies to action horror more than, but just as you don't want to restrict your player too much, you don't want to give them too much control or freedom. A good example of this is in Resident Evil 4, you know, it originally came out for, you know, a standard console controller with generally unreliable twin stick aiming, so, you know, you have to make sure your shots actually count or you'll waste what you have. But they made a port for the Wii, which had motion controls, which made it incredibly easy to aim and just take out enemies uh, with headshots and make the game very easy and a lot less scary that way. So that's often why a lot of old games and sometimes new games will especially have uh, tank controls just to make it a little harder to control, a little less free so you can't really dance around your enemies. So it's a, it's a balance you have to strike. You can't give your, uh, you can't give your horror game full platformer precision and not get away without a little tweaking to it. Speaking of tank controls, psychological horror games. The main focus with psychological horror is the use of the human psyche and personal fears with the player or with people in general. A lot of these games are very story- oh, sorry? Amnesia. Yeah. Play original. But yeah, um, a lot of these games are very story and character focused. They may um, use use of unreliable narrators, and sometimes they have gameplay and uh, elements that can trick the player. Like maybe if you try to move forward, it moves backwards instead, or if the character is like intoxicated, the control is just all over the place. And because of that, the gameplay can be very limited and difficult to control. 
especially because a lot of these games, like for example, the Silent Hill series, they have characters that aren't very like strong or aren't really fighters. So they kind of replicate that in the gameplay by having it, having like the characters be kind of difficult to like hit things. So the best thing you can really do is run for the most part. And also they can be pretty slow paced since they are story focus. So it may take a little bit of time for you to like make progress. As the examples of these is with Silent Hill 2, Soma, and Fatal Frame series. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very fun title up this line. Uh, it's more of an action game, third person action game on the GameCube. The game called Eternal Darkness uh, is pretty fun. At least the way it uh, tackles doing psychological stuff uh, to the player specifically. Um, I think it has like a sanity meter. Uh, it's not a very popular game, so I wouldn't say I know a lot about the mechanics, but I think there's like a sanity meter sort of uh, that sort of has. And as it goes lower and lower, it'll actually mess the player themselves, not just the character, by changing different um, like TV settings. It'll act as if it's changing your volume or like do like static. Um, it might even go so far as to like flip the camera screen in certain ways. Um, but tackling like psychological horror in that direction could be pretty fun too. I'd imagine a lot of those effects wouldn't be as effective now that UI and TVs have changed so much. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a classic like green bar volume. The good old days. Yeah, me personally, psychological horror is my favorite because I think um, it tackles like the biggest scares, in my opinion. Like, because a lot of these games also are made by uh, East Asian developers, and honestly, I think they make really good horror. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one, action horror. Very similar to survival horror, but it relies a lot more on combat than really survival. They're a lot more fast paced, a lot more thriller based, and it relies a lot more on using like creature design and grotesque imagery to kind of scare you. But the hard thing about it is that it can be really difficult to make these games scary because you're already like fairly powerful it, it's not really like all that stressful to beat the enemies because you're like okay i can already kind of beat them so it's very easy to lose its scare factor and you're more likely just having fun beating up enemies than really getting scared so like that uh, examples of these is like with resident evil 4 and dead space and doom they can still be scary but it isn't really most people probably aren't going to really be staying up at night thinking about you know the monsters yeah a lot of it really comes from the uh, themes or storylines um like you might see visually but not mechanic wise um to be scary uh perhaps mostly an echo of like older uh, nes or arcade games that might have like scary themes to them um classic castlevania games that have you know spooky skeletons zombies that sort of stuff but the gameplay itself is actually just a regular old game. Yeah, I notice a lot of them use like zombies, mm. which they're not. Zombies aren't really all that scary to me anymore because just how overused they are in media. But yeah, most of the time you just kind of have to rely on having like freaky character designs for it. All right, stealth horror. The main objective of these games is to escape and not get caught. Generally, the threat that is attacking the player is undefeatable, so the only thing you can really do is run from it, because trying to beat it will just get you killed. So it keeps it can keep the player on edge, and it relies on the player to think fast to try to avoid you know, getting caught. A lot of these games use a lot of puzzles, but it can get monotonous over time, and you can lose a scare factor if you understand the enemy's like pattern, or if you're just not scared of the enemy in general. This genre probably plays too much on the suspense idea and like leading the player along for way too long. Um, as uh, we've been mentioning earlier, with uh, making sure your suspense is just the right amount of time, um, it's probably what stealth horror plays on too much and uh, cheapens the feel, especially if you can start to learn um, enemy patterns over time. Yeah, so examples of these with Outlast and Amnesia. Mm -hmm. So it's worth knowing that. Uh, it's not, again, it's one of those things where you have to know the rules to break it, yeah. but you can have the enemy's pattern be a 
important part of the game where the player has to learn the enemy pattern through observation or something and then can work around it. Because if the enemy is too predictable, if they're too smart, they can just be annoying or feel impossible to get around. Yeah. So it's a tricky balance to strike. Yeah. I still generally do like these types of games though, because they also have a pretty interesting story. And of course it's also worth noting that you can blend all these together. Yeah, like I said. Or blend elements of these into other games for a nice effect. Uh, my Metroid fan may be shown here, but Metroid Dread uh, has these stealth horror sections where you have to escape from these, uh, you know, crazy mobile robots, and eventually at the end of the section, uh, you do get a weapon to take them down. And there's a few of them throughout the game, so each section by itself isn't too long, but it's a good break from everything else that's going on, and it's sort of short enough that you won't really get walled too hard, mostly. The purple one sucks. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of these like genres are different elements of horror, and you can honestly add all of these into one game if you wanted to. But like with these specific genres, that's like the main focus of the scare factor generally. Well, what was the what were the examples for the pictures up there? Because we had uh, examples mm -hmm. listed for the others. Yeah, that's those. Uh, top one is Outlast, and the bottom one is Amnesia. I, I forgot to add it on there. <laughs> all right. And the next one is <laughs> jump scare horror. They're the easiest scare to pull, but it can also be the cheapest. Um, it relies a lot on shocking the player by using, you know, loud noises, scary faces, and you're not anticipating it's going to be there. It's very overused and oversaturated, and it can very easily lose its scare factor because of just getting jump scared all the time. You get desensitized to it. And also, a lot of these games lack a lot of extra gameplay because their main focus is the jump scare, so they don't really add any other gameplay mechanics to it. And of course, examples of these are Five Nights at Freddy's, the most famous one, and honestly, countless other indie horror games that you find on Steam. The, the one on the top right um, is apparently a Michael Jackson horror game called the... Just the Iwoki or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> Escape from the Aiwoki. And if you don't understand the pun of Aiwoki, are you okay? Uh, are you okay? From Billy Jean. Not that Billy Jean, I mean. That is the Michael Jackson either. reference. I like it. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, these ones, uh, jump scare can, or can pretty often fall flat due to the uh, uh, kind of. Paradoxically, the lack of suspense, um, where it just focuses on the payoff with no buildup, because um, contradictory, in a contradiction to what you might expect, the player doesn't really know whether to be in a state of suspense or not, just because the game's always, always waiting for the next moment to scare you. Yeah, and it's like with the jump scare, it can be, it can start becoming less scary and more annoying, because I don't know if you guys watch like Markiplier. But like, you know, when he was like doing the 2020 runs, over time he starts getting kind of just like whatever with the jump scares instead of, you know, getting scared. Like, they lose the scare factor real quick. It starts just becoming more annoying when you get killed than really getting scared. So honestly, I'd honestly just avoid making jump scare horror games because they're just, I just feel they're just really lazy. They can be done well. The main thing you have to consider is that whenever you have the jump scare, it's going to burn all of the suspense you've been building up, because it's kind of over. Especially if it's in a game like what we have here, where the jump scare is also the you die indicator, because there's not much you can do about it. You get scared, and that's it. You lose. In other games, uh, typically, if you get a uh, jump scare caught unawares, you still have to deal with the threat that's attacking you. So the suspense is still there. It's not just, you know, oh crap, scary thing. It's oh crap, scary thing, and now I have to deal with it. So jump scares can be done well. You just have to work a lot around it because they burn all the suspense. And if you have them be the death, yeah, that's just it. Just kind of doesn't give you anything to be scared of anymore because by the time the animation is playing, you're already dead. You know, it's just ah, whatever, I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, some games have done it well. It's just a bit difficult to accomplish. Uh, sometimes uh, games will have the jump scare be the end of the game, which kind of works out because, you know, 
you're building up tension all game, you end the game, and there's no, there's not really anything bad about burning up all the build up then, because the game's over. But that doesn't work for everything, of course. Yeah, I say more often I have to focus on like a uh, actual consequences for the player in terms of gameplay, because if it's over, then you're like, oh, okay, it's over, I'll try again then. Yeah. The moment, moment this becomes a game over screen, no matter how off, you know, no matter how scary you make the game over screen, it's it just sort of doesn't mean anything to the player aside. Oh, I have to try again. And generally, that's a tricky, tricky balance to strike. So it can be done. It's usually more successful like mixed with other genres, so that you know, again, repeating myself here, you get jump scared, and then you have to do something about the threat that is now immediately in front of you. But it's just all about hitting that balance, which is much harder here, and of course, easier said than done. I'm not a horror game developer. He is. Ask him. Oh, I'm not. I've, I've been lied to. This is the true jump scare all along. <laughs> <laughs> So, someone, oh, sorry, oh, oh, uh, so someone brought up in the Discord uh, like uh, Spooky's House of Jump Scares and Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. And I'd say that's an example of it being done better. Mm. Yeah. Again, I haven't fully played it. I don't play a lot of horror games in general, so I can't say. But I've heard very good things about it. So, yes, it can be done. You just have to be very aware of everything that's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Ways to make your horror game stop being scary. Making the enemy too predictable. As what Tyler mentioned, if you have your enemy's pattern uh, be too predictable or something similar like that, it can lose the scare factor because you already know what the enemy is going to do, what part, where they're going to come from, and so that's another way you can lose your scare factor. As what Quinn mentioned, if you have too many jump scares or you have bad timing use of jump scares, it can definitely destroy the scare factor of it very quickly. And like I said before, it can get very annoying, actually, if there's just so many jump scares being hit at you. Overly discussing the player. I'll go more into detail about that, technically, in the next slide. But what I mean by that is, you know how like games like to do like gross-out scenes and try to shock you? If you have too much of that, it can just get like weird and just it's sort of uncomfortable. To it almost. Yeah, it can sometimes ruin your experience playing the game because if they just keep giving you shocking imagery, you're like, wow, look at this disgusting thing you saw. It's just like, I get it. <laughs> and also, as someone mentioned with uh, Phasmophobia, adding multiplayer or having multiple characters in your party can also destroy the scare factor. Because the main thing with horror is that you want to isolate your player because you know humans naturally are social creatures we are better in packs if you separate us in the pack then we're more likely to get killed we're more likely to die add on to that you can't have multiplayer horror games if you give the players incentive to split up and especially if you implement something like proximity voice chat because then there's you know not the horror of if you're safe you have to now wonder you know how is everyone else doing? When I get back, will they still be there kind of thing? Yeah. So again, can be done. It's just difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult to have a horror game be multiplayer because, you know, when everyone's all together, and especially if since this is a game, it's not actually like, you're not actually in that situation. It can just, you can just kind of make jokes about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also another thing, too much combat. Um, as mentioned with, that's like one of the main issues with action horror games, where if your enemy, if your player is just too powerful, where they can just kind of kill everything, then there isn't really much of a threat being made. So like with a game like God of War, for example, you may be going against like scary creatures, but you're not really scared because your player, Kratos, he can just kill them. So you wouldn't really count that as a horror game. So if you want to really like amp up the scare factor, make sure you're player is just like an average dude. <laughs> Don't make him like some super soldier that can just kill anything. And, uh, one other thing that wasn't listed here, make sure that your atmosphere in general ambience is good. Of course there's the obvious, you know, don't play happy, upbeat music during a spooky section because just complete tonal clash does it, but especially, uh, the, I suppose the most obvious example is the Resident Evil Director's Cut basement theme, <laughs> which is like someone took a mini trumpet and just started slamming their arm all over the keyboard, 
and it's supposed to be like this really scary, uncertain area. You know, it's you know literally a basement. There's all sorts of unsettling things going on, and there's just trumpets in the background. So. So I'm sad about that. Um. So I saw a video about it. Apparently, the director, like the composer for that, pretended to be deaf. Oh yeah, he did pretend to be deaf. And he wasn't actually all that great of a composer. So that's kind of like the whole like gist about why it sounded the way it did. But there's also like extra lore about the you know aftermath of all that. That yeah. is one half of a rebel. But yeah, generally, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna want to have good atmosphere for your horror games. You know. Yeah. Usually, you know, if you can't or if you don't, if you're not confident in your music, just get general sounds, of course. I talked about sound design the other day. But, you know, get sounds of, you know, things that would be there, you know, if there's wind, if there's machinery. Sometimes just a slight shift in the ambience can be enough to set the player on edge. Like, if you're walking around the forest and then there's wind and all of a sudden it just stops or slows down, silence is very, very powerful. Make sure to use it well. I suppose if Iron Lung is also a good example of that. I keep bringing that game up, but that game it does have a soundtrack, actually. But uh, a lot of the times, it's just you're only really hearing the sound of your submarine moving through the ocean and the creatures around you. So when things happen, even if you don't know what's happening, you can just tell by the sound. Yeah. yeah. So you know, the main key takeaway from all this is balance different aspects of horror, Use them in moderation and understand when to use them. And don't skimp out on the atmosphere. If you underpay your atmosphere director or whoever, it will show. So, how can I make my game scary? So you, first thing you can do, of course, is create fear, create that scare factor in general. So emphasize a threat towards the player. It doesn't have to be a direct threat, like obviously a monster is coming towards you, but you can imply a threat being made towards the player by maybe like having, I don't know, the, the leaves like rustling whenever they're walking in a forest or some flashbacks or it's just something that implies that a threat is being made towards the player. And even minor, um, you mentioned auditory or visual cues that might not actually be something in the environment that's active, but it you know, can trick the player or imply something's going to happen later. Like I said, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm jumping in. Yeah, like I said with last week's sound design, you want to give basically every possible action a sound, especially more here, just because the more you keep the player on edge, yeah, if you have a bird that just flies off, give that a sound. Give anything and everything a sound so the player never knows what to expect. And of course, if you give your uh, antagonist a distinctive sound, well, then they'll eventually learn to be afraid of it. Uh, this is sort of not really a horror game, but uh, Left 4 Dead 2. Uh, whenever a powerful enemy spawns in, which you know you do want to be scared of, they always have this distinct musical jingle that sometimes you can place before they come in. So if you hear that in advance, you sort of know, uh oh, something's happening. So yeah, mm -hmm. sound effects are incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. I've said it five minutes ago. I will say it again. I'll probably say it five minutes from now. Sound effects are powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the second point, uh, isolate the player. As I mentioned before, humans are social creatures. Isolating us from the pack will scare us because we have no one to protect us and no one to rely back on. And I mean that literally and also psychologically. And what I mean by psychologically is there may be like other characters there, but they may not be seeing the same thing as the player is or they may not be reacting the same way as the player is. So like said, a good example of this is Silent Hill 2, where James is, you know, in the town and he's meeting all the different people he's seeing, like Angela, um, Eddie, and Laura, and all these characters react very differently. Like with Angela, at first she's like kind of scared, and then later on you meet her, she's like looking kind of depressed and suicidal. And then Eddie, later on, he starts becoming more, like, maniacal and dangerous. And Laura's a big example of this is she's, like, acting like everything's normal when the town is full of monsters, but she isn't reacting at all, especially it's weird since she's a little girl. So you can isolate the player that way by making it, you know, feel like they're the only one seeing all the craziness happening to them. 
Um, I could say in that vein, um, Phasmophobia or like Devil Daylight, similar games that might be uh, you know a team of players or even asymmetrical, um, can play this pretty well. Because like you've mentioned, Phasmophobia can just be a fun time with friends. Uh, but as soon as stuff actually starts getting real and you're getting picked up one by one, it might actually start to take a uh, sour turn. Um, there's like tons of classic videos of like famous YouTubers like Markiplier playing Phasmophobia. Um, lots of very fun moments where one of them's like trapped in the house screaming, um, and everyone else is like, oh shit, we can't get them, they're dead. Um, it very much ups the ante about you know, what you can and have to do, um, and what can happen to you. Um, so you, you can play them in tons of different directions. We already kind of talked about sound effects, <laughs> so we can move on to... I said the less we know, the better, which basically means uh, fear, of the fear of the unknown is what Tyler er mentioned earlier. Humans are scared of the unknown. We don't like not knowing what's happening. We're very much a species of we have to have answers. Because like even with, for example, how many of you guys like open-ended endings where like they don't tell you exactly what happens to everyone at the end, but you're, it's just like kind of... It's, it's come up to your interpretations, I guess. Are you guys familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah, I just yeah. don't like them. Oh, you don't like them? All right. Yeah. See, we're, we don't like not knowing what's happening. So when you give us too many details about our enemy, we're less likely to be scared of them because we understand them. A good example of using the fear of the unknown, I'm pretty sure you guys have heard of him, Junji Ito. He uses that a lot. He never explains like where the monster or entity or whatever in the stories come from, why it's happening, but it happens and you can't really do much about that. And that's why a lot of his stories are like really impactful and scary. So like I said, the less we know about what's you know, coming after us, the scarier it will be for us. And uh, an example sort of the opposite of this is if you look at a speed run of any horror game, you will you can just see the runner not being scared of anything at all. They will do the wildest things just because they practice with the AI and general tricks so much. Like they will just straight up see the monster, continue doing puzzles, roll past it at the last moment. Because once you know everything there is to know, it becomes you know an entirely predictable pattern. It can just be very easy to just view it as an obstacle to get around and completely loses the scary factor other than, hey, avoid this thing. So again, that's sort of something that's inevitable. You can't really design around it all that much. It's just funny to see uh, speed runs of horror games and just how little they actually care about the things going on around them. So. Yeah. Don't, don't design your horror game around speedrunners, though. It's kind of impossible to work with that. <laughs> yeah, that happens to any game, really. Yeah. Uh... So the next thing you can do is add shock value. This is kind of like the proper way of how to use jump scares. Jump scares in itself aren't bad. It's just like I said, a lot of people don't know how to use them properly, and people overuse them or rely on them way too much and it's not very good. So if you want to create a good jump scare, like I said, create a false sense of security to amplify it. So if you're like, you know, coming back and just like walking your character through like a forest or whatever, everything seems calm. You're not really like expecting anything. And next thing you know, your character stops and then they turn around and see a monster behind them or something like that. So that would be a good example of using false sense of security. The, good, the thing is though that you shouldn't use it too much because then like I said, too many jump scares, the player can get annoyed. So I would only ever use that for like certain situations to really like catch the player off guard. And another uh, use of this is maybe foreshadowing elements of a jump scare or using red herrings to create suspense. Um, so, for example, with, I used this GIF, I used, there was, I wanted to find, like, another GIF where, like, you saw the wheelchair from her, from, like, the, the wheelchair's perspective, but I couldn't really find it. But, basically, in Silent Hill 3, 
when you're walking through the hospital, you can come across like this, when you're like going through a corner, you can see an angle of like a wheelchair, a, a wheelchair just spinning. And it, it's not really like explained. Well, it actually doesn't really mean much of anything, but it's just there. It's like a kind of like a, gets you on edge, suspense of like, okay, there's something here. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, can I add something to that? Yeah. So the fact that that wheel is spinning and the character has no control over stopping that wheel from spinning or like making that screeching sound or something mm -hmm. is something that also adds to the horror yeah. because they don't, they don't have control over that creepy sound or whatever action that's going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that even makes me think of really uh, weird pull, but in Minecraft, um, the weird cave noises that happen. Um, <laughs> not, uh, they're maybe connected to something specific, I'm not sure, but um, you have no control of them, and even if there's nothing near you, it'll creep you the hell out, so. Yeah, Sound Hill is a lot of those elements where it's not really anything important, but it's just there to kind of freak you out. <laughs> Sometimes, if you make it infrequent enough, sometimes you'll forget what's happening and you'll just be spooked by the fact that the sound exists. Like, even if you've heard those specific cave sounds 500 times before, if they're spaced out enough, the mere fact of there being a sound where there wasn't before can make you jump before you realize, oh, it's just the cave sounds. Just the cave demons hanging around. Kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, and another example of like foreshadowing elements. Um... Do you guys like? Do you guys care about spoilers for like Resident Evil and Biohazard? Okay. Um. So, if you know about the game, you know there's like the family, and then there's the grandma. She doesn't do anything, but she's just in the background. It looks like she's almost kind of watching you. And you know, later on in the game, you realize that oh, she's a uh, she's a uh, a big threat. <laughs> So that's another example of foreshadowing element of suspense to kind of create that jump scare. And the last point is disturbing the player. As I mentioned before, with like overly disturbing the player, you can add disturbing elements though, you know, but use it right and in moderation. So examples is like depicting body horror, using the uncanny valley, um, showing off the darkness of the human psyche of society, twisting something that's normal to something that's disturbing. So like an example of the last point, which I do like that one, I example again with Jinji Ito with how he generally makes stories about normal things, but makes them into something that's disturbing. Cause like if I just told you, oh, the town is being infested by spirals and without any sort of context, you'd be like, that doesn't really sound all that scary. But when you actually read the story, it's just like... When you see people turning into weird spiral shapes or um, hair controlling itself and strangling people, yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. And psychological horror deals a lot with exploring the darkness of human psyche and society, showing off awful people doing awful things, or maybe the characters going through a lot of like intense uh, trauma mm -hmm. and of course with action horror they explore a lot with doing body horror and just having like grotesque monster designs mm -hmm. like a something in particular um it's a very clear like oh you're in an abstract world that represents um the psyche of usually a main character or like psyche of multiple characters in the story and it will give you just like a direct one-to-one um, -one, like representation of actions they've done or how they view certain things in the world. Um, I think it's on all three in particular has a lot of clear stuff. Like there's uh, stuff that's happened to the main character um, in her life. I don't know anything about the Silent Story really, but it's a lot of symbol symbolism about uh, pregnancy and mm -hmm. women. Uh, being in a society where they're preyed upon, they explore a lot of things like that. Okay. So, next thing is the technical aspects of it. We explained sound effects and sound design multiple times already, but yeah, 
using good sound effects, using good sound design can really amplify the horror aspect of it. Limited the vision of the player, so how much can the player see? So, you know, a lot of horror games like to have them in the dark because it limits your vision, limits what, you know, may pop out out of the shadows. Um, using certain horror elements depending on the graphical aspects of your game. So if your game is, you know, hyper-realistic, CGI, like Evil Within, you would probably rely more on uh, grotesque uh, monster designs to show off the graphics of it. Um, I used an example of a puppet combo game. And um, before I play this, people online, the audio is kind of loud. I'm not too sure if it'll be like that for your computer, but it is not as loud on here. But I just wanted to give that warning just in case you're like listening to me on full volume. Once again, here's a different voice, so you're paying attention. This is your official volume warning. <laughs> I, I tried to make sure it's not super loud, though. Uh, you have a question? Okay, so I wanted to talk about limiting the vision of the player. Mm -hmm. So do you think that decreasing their field of view, like actual FOV, in maybe scary moments or something like that will increase the horror? That can't help, and that's why a lot of games, uh, horror games, use things like flashlights. Think about things like Slender and stuff, where yeah. Technically, the field of view is wide, but you can only see so much due to your light. Oh, yeah, yeah. So oftentimes, if you want to make something a little spooky, you have, you know, a light that goes dim or goes out. You know, you'll be in a lit house and the power suddenly flickers out and you can see less. Yeah. So light is another very important thing to work with for horror games. But if we're going for, like, more of a surrealist kind of thing, you could absolutely mess with the player's field of view. Just know that... Uh, if you shift it constantly, it gets very disorienting, and they might not be able to see the scary thing. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, something to mess around with, but I think it's a really cool idea. Look, once again, volume warning. Actually, wait, hold on. This. So we were playing the game. Um, there is no music or audio, so you just kind of like. You know, walk around, whatever. But if this nun sees you, that audio starts playing in full volume. <laughs> and it can really catch you off guard. <laughs> it's like another form of jump scare, but add it with stealth elements of you don't want to get caught because she'll just instantly kill you if you see her or you also got to run. But yeah, it's funny. That's like an example of, you know, using sound effects. And also using um, elements of horror with graphical aspects, because their games are generally made in the style of like 1980s like, horror one movies. Style of games. Yeah. And for, you know, like with horror, like kind of like lower res graphics, it actually kind of makes things a little scarier sometimes. I can't really explain like the exact reason on why, yeah. but it yeah. is really effective. I mean, at least like the VHS feel for other games, um, you know, unless it's the classic horror movie feel, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, but yeah, something about the, the PS1 um, graphics also elevates it a little higher. Uh, they were pretty well made in general, though, besides that, you know. Yeah. Because uh, it's like games that try to be like more realistic, it isn't really all that scary sometimes. No. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think of unintentional horror games? Uh, do you have any examples? Um, Kirby games. Um, that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, I mean, they can. They, there's a, a little bit of intentional horror, how they're like cosmic horror mostly. Mm -hmm. But I see what you mean, how it's like most just a cutesy game, and you don't really get to the scary stuff unless you like see the uh, implications in like pause menu descriptions that sort of stuff or if you get to release your classes or if you look um, at what the definitions of the word in the final boss theme means mm. yes th thank you nintendo i know exactly what a roche limit is <laughs> <laughs> i do remember like in kirby all-star like i think it's the during the true arena you're like fighting star? i think so i forget which one 
But um, you're fighting against Marx, like his kind of like demonic. Soul? Huh? Are you talking about his soul? Yeah, like his soul. And when you beat him, he starts doing this like ear curling screech, which can be kind of like freaky, especially mm. considering he like splits in half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. Also, in that scene of Superstar Ultra, there's a cutscene of like this like dead body floating in space, and then he gets revived and then fights the player and stuff. So that kind of adds an extra layer to that bridge. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, whenever you find unintentional horror games, it can be very, very cool, and it's worth looking into those because sometimes you can sort of discover if you can discover why it's so terrifying, you can replicate that more intently. And as someone mentioned in the uh, uh, Discord, uh, the entire genre of analog horror, which we didn't cover much, is largely based around, you know, corrupted old tapes, which had all sorts of video artifact, video artifacts and audio stuttering. And sometimes these things can just come out of nowhere. Uh, I'll get to your question soon, I promise. But, uh, like, sometimes, uh, when I was making a game in a very old version, uh, I didn't put the proper safety checks on it, so it started eventually reading and writing to unknown memory, and that just eventually started corrupting the video and audio, like straight up turned it into a creepy pasta. So sometimes things like that can be interesting, and it's worth, you know, taking inspiration and looking at it if you want to make a horror game. I think I remember correctly. Uh, didn't the creator of Fight at Freddy's start out trying to make educational games and then made a horror game when people thought his models were too scary? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. He started off. He started off with pretty more kids and uh, Christianity-based games, and um, one of the games he did was um, Chipper and Sons, basically a woodlaw game. One of the critiques, one of the critics said it looks way too much like um, like those old animatronics you see at Chuck E. Cheese, and instead of such the mini defeat, he thought, hmm, maybe I'd make it. Hmm, I wonder what I can make it out of that that idea, and Five Nights at Freddy's was born. Yeah. And that's sort of a game that was in general, it's just, mm -hmm. there's opportunities everywhere, you just gotta keep your eyes out for interesting things going on. Did you have another question? Um, it's really small, but I think another game that sort of had unintentional horror was Splatoon. Um, during one of the boss when you beat the final boss, um, this um, very weird sound plays, if you want to look it up. Are you talking about Octo Expansion? Uh, no, it's been around since the first game. Oh, like the post, uh, like after you beat the boss, like the, some strange Yeah. Movies. I remember hearing about that, I don't think yeah. I ran into it myself. Yeah, you can probably look it up on there. Yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, games will have tiny little unsettling details, and people will hang on to that, like, uh, in Mario games, uh, I believe it was in Galaxy 2? Yeah, one of the there Galaxy is, games, there's, like, yeah, there is a, a skybox that has these, uh, unsettling, humanoid-ish looking figures, uh, down from a cliff. You can only see if you go in, like, first person and look way up, and this kind of stare at you. I believe the internal file for, like, called, like, Hell Valley Sky Tree, but it's just those tiny little details that, uh, Stick out people. Similarly, in uh, Super Mario 3D Land, there's a certain ghost house level where if you just wait around at the exit for a specific time, a little specter appears at the end and disappears. So sometimes it's the tiniest details that really stick with people. Like even you know, back to Mario 64, the piano, of course. Uh, <laughs> someone brought that up in the Discord earlier. But also tiny little mysteries like that. Uh, there's like a star fountain, which has legible text because the N64 didn't know what a texture was. <laughs> but it had this illegible text on it that, of course, led to the people thinking the phrase was L is real 2000, like 2401, I believe it was. And so it's just those tiny little mysteries born from either mistakes or oversights, or just the smallest little details that can really spark people's imagination. So look out for those kind of things and think what you can do to expand upon it. Or maybe just leave it as a detail so that someone else can expand upon it. Yeah. There's just a lot of cool things you can do. Oh, yeah, Clint, I know you brought up creepypastas, yeah. and I was thinking about, like, Sonic.exe and, like, the binge round, kind of. 
Yeah. Yeah, Sonic Dog UC has been experiencing a big resurgence lately thanks to Friday Night Funkin'. Um, the Dan John one is a little freaky, I will say. Yeah, but I think that's just more to do to Majora's Mask being inherently freaky as a good base to work with. Majora's Mask, yeah. Mm-hmm. Majora's Mask does have some horror elements. Have you seen the moon? The moon. <laughs> the moon. I mean... And yeah, of course, the moon's the big one. But there's all sorts of other just unsettling details everywhere in that game. It's incredible. They do like to actively like hang a lantern on the top on the subject of death in that game. It's yeah. Um, I guess like in a similar vein um, with like the small details, um, which I guess Nintendo does this a lot with a lot of their like older games from like two thousands. Um, Ocarina of Time uh, has the Temple for the Shadow Temple. Uh, there's a section where you go into a well. Uh, it's a little, not really unsettling, more uh, classic dungeon feeling where you're fighting, you know, flying skeletons, uh, or flying uh, skeleton heads, um, finding like new items, you'll see the walls, that sort of stuff. And then you come across the boss, which is a uh, very thin, gangly white creature. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, like that like thing. hovers across the ground at you and has various hands coming out of the ground, which can grab you, uh, letting him get closer to you and bite you with this really weirdly shaped face. I suppose. Uh, oh, sorry. Is oh, that you're done? You're good. No, I, it doesn't last for very long, um, and it's just a very small boss fight, but it, especially in the N64 version of it, um, it makes you go, what the hell is happening? Yeah, generally, one thing we didn't really cover all that much is just contrast, because a lot of things you're talking about are just very small, spooky, or weird, or strange details, and otherwise, you know, mostly bright, cheery, upbeat, you know, simple games. And so sort of the reverse can be true for horror games. You don't want your player to always be scared all the time, because that's a good way to burn them out. You want them to have moments of rest, moments of safety that they can sort of cling to. And then, of course, you can be evil and take that away near the end. Uh, yeah, that's you brought up Silent Hill 4 for a while. Yeah. And at first, throughout like the first half of the game, uh, you can always just return to your room from the... You know, creepy things happening, you can just heal, you can save for free, it's very nice. But once you get past the first half of the game, your room starts getting haunted as well. You can no longer heal and save there. So it's it's a lot more effective if you give the player something first and then take it away. Yeah. Which is also why a lot of uh, games that, you know, pretend to be something happy and then are solid something creepy, you know, give you time to sort of warm up to everything that's going on before sending it all to hell. Doki Doki Wish Yeah, that's, I was actually bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, band in Discord, there's Doki Doki. Mm-hmm. Yep. Someone has to bring up Doki Doki. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's good for a reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't just have your game be all scary all the time. You have to give your player some sort of relief. Something to actually care about. And maybe crush it if you feel like it. Although, <laughs> you, you could also just make it so that you have this incredibly cryptic seven-part sequence to get a true best ending. But you know that's optional, I think. 